I'd like to speak about buildings. We all know buildings, right? We were born in buildings, we were raised in buildings, most of us are working in buildings, we may even die in buildings. But let's forget about us for a while and let's focus on the building life cycle itself. If we want to create a building, the first thing, we would need to extract materials, we would need to process that material in order to manufacture a new component, and we will assemble those components according to plans. And the plans will vary. A school is different from a factory, a house is different from an office building, we need different spaces, we have different needs. And so we are building, we are constructing our buildings according to our needs. But our needs evolve quite fast and the building lifespan is quite long. Just to give you an example, 60 years ago there would have been always a wall in between the kitchen and the living room. Today we don't build that wall anymore, we don't need it. Another example, two years ago, before the pandemic started, no one would have expected that most of the students, most of the employees would have to work from home in a separate office, in their own house, in their own apartment, right next to the kids, to the friends, to the family. So our needs are evolving quite fast. And the good news is that building can adapt to that. We can add a wall, we can remove a wall, we can extend the building, we can replace the envelope, we can transform an office building into an apartment building and vice versa. But at some point, the buildings will not be able to adapt anymore and we will have to replace it. At some point, any building may become obsolete. It may happen in 20 years from now, it may happen in 100 years, it may happen in 200 years, we don't know. But what we know is that we are demolishing buildings on a daily basis today. And this is an environmental issue. Today, one-third of all solid waste in Europe is due to the construction and demolition of buildings. Today, at least 11% of all greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions related to human processes are due to the construction, the transformation and the demolition of buildings. And these numbers do not take into account the greenhouse gas emissions related to the operation of the building, so the, the heating, the ventilation, the, um, the cooling and the electricity in the buildings. This at least 11% of greenhouse gas emissions are just related to the construction, the transformation and the demolition of buildings. And these numbers, these amounts, will grow in the next years. The main reason is that the world population will grow in the next 50 years mainly in urban areas, and that will put more pressure on existing buildings because sustainable cities will have to grow from within. That means that smaller buildings will have to leave room for bigger buildings. So there are reasons why we are demolishing buildings and it's very hard to go against that. But the real issue here is that whenever we demolish a building, we actually throw away its parts as well, its beams, its doors, its slabs, its windows. But those parts are still performing well. Most of the time, the reason why we demolish a building is because we don't use it, and we don't need it anymore. We don't need it at that location, at that point in time. But it's still a safe building. Its slabs can still be used as slabs, its columns are still good columns, doors are still good doors. So here is my question. Why aren't we allowing those components to outlive the depths of their building? And why aren't we reusing those components in new configurations elsewhere for new purposes? Because every reused component is a component that is not manufactured. Imagine the amount of waste that could be avoided. Imagine the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that could be avoided. 
This is not my idea, this is not a new idea, this is actually a pretty common sense idea that people applied in the past on a daily basis. Just to give you an example, here is a bridge built in 1810 over the Rhine at the border between Switzerland and, and Germany. It's a very nice timber-covered bridge. But 100 years later, engineers decided to replace that bridge with a, a bigger one. And the story is very interesting because parts of the beams used in that beams have been moved and used in order to build this new barn in the village nearby. And if we look at the cuts of the columns on, on that barn, we can actually see the traces of the past of these co uh, columns. We can see the heritage, the embedded heritage of the previous uses of these columns. So this barn was built in 1920 and it's still in use today, 100 years later. So what do we have here in front of us? We have a 100 year old building that is made of 200 year old components. And that's really the spirit of reuse. The goal of the reuse strategy is to expand the lifespan of the component as much as we can, even if it means that those components are fulfilling new purposes. Today, reuse is one of the few strategies that will allow to, to reach a circular economy uh, alongside with the recycling strategy. We all know um, about recycling, but it's actually completely different from the reuse strategy. Whenever we recycle a material, we would reprocess it. We would apply energy, we would transform it, we would melt it, we would um, crush it in order to create a brand new material. But in the reuse strategies, we don't want to touch the component. We want to reuse it as it is. We want to benefit from all the embedded value inside the component that is already there. And the application of reuse and the circular economy can bring a lot of benefits. It can allow us to reach more environmental sustainability, to reach more economic sustainability and more social sustainability as well. But the truth is that today reuse is not um, common at all. And there are reasons why. There are indeed technological barriers, there are legal barriers, and there are also psychological barriers. Why psychological barriers? Because we, we as humans, we tend to be afraid of things that we don't know. And this is a real issue whenever we have to reuse components. But I believe that those barriers are temporary and must be tackled now. And for that reason, I'm leading a team of wonderful researchers, architects, and civil engineers and our aim is to explore new ways of reusing components, such as to contribute to the fight against climate crisis and to avoid any potential future resource crisis. The very first project that, that we did was to build this pavilion made of skis. Thousands of skis are um, thrown away every year and ski is a composite material that is very hard to recycle. But there is a very useful technological value embedded inside those skis. So why don't we reuse it? Are we going to save the world with skis and buildings? Well, no, definitely not. But there are a few key takeaways that we can get from this experiment. The main one is that we show that we can build high performance structures structures with very complex mechanical behavior while not controlling everything about the material that we put in place. We don't know the skis, we don't know where they come from, they are all different, we don't know what they are made of, we don't know um, their mechanical properties. But it's okay, we can build enough confidence in order to make sure that the the, the structure is safe, and it's all that matters. We don't have to control everything. And so we are helping our architects and engineers to make more reuse 
in their practice. And if we look at the design process itself, we are actually facing a completely different um, problem. In a conventional design process, the designer would first draw the overall shape of the structure. And then little by little, more information will be discovered until we know exactly how we want to manufacture the components. We know what properties we want to have, what lengths we want to have, we know what materials we want to use. But whenever we deal with an existing stock of elements, those properties, they are given. The lengths of the um, components are given, their dimensions are given, their mechanical properties are given, the material is given as well. And we have to deal with that. And the new goal now is to find the best shape, the shape that will make the best reuse of these components. So we are developing algorithms and tools in order to automate part of this process. And we're also applying these tools to case studies. And here is a case study performed by a master student. He actually designed a roof truss for a train station out of elements that are only coming from dismantled pi electric pylons. And those electric pylons are actually about to be dismantled in the area. And with that case study, but also with all the other case studies that we do, whenever we compare two steel trusses, for instance, one um, in one scenario made with reused components and in the other scenario made with brand new components, newly manufactured components with recycled content in them. So whenever we compare these two trusses, what we see is that in the reuse scenario, the mass is always bigger. Usually we would say that it's an issue, but actually it's okay. I mean, it's just there because we are not using the material in the most efficient way. But what matters is that in all cases, greenhouse gas emissions related to the construction of the reused scenario are lower than the one in the new scenario. And this is what matters if we want to lower global warming. There are many questions that have to be addressed um, as soon as possible. We are also looking at how the reuse potential of existing building stocks can be assessed on a large scale, so on a territorial scale. We are also, also looking at ways to better reclaim existing reinforced concrete slabs and walls in buildings. And last but not least, we are also looking at new ways to design slab systems that can be reused in the future with new spans in between columns, with new floor plans, with new loads applied to them, without oversizing the components, the slabs themselves. We don't know what the future will be about. We don't know what will be the needs in 100, 200 years from now, what buildings will have to, to, to provide. But it doesn't mean that we cannot try to ease the dismantling of the components we put in place today. And it doesn't mean that we cannot try to make sure that those components can be reused in new unknown configurations. So, in conclusion, the message here is that if we want to fight the climate crisis, if we want to avoid any future resource crisis, we have to give more value to the things that already exist. We have to give more value to the buildings that already exist. We have to keep them, to maintain them as much as we can. But once those buildings cannot exist anymore, and there are reasons why at some point any building may not exist anymore, may be demolished, then at that moment we have to make sure that components, the parts of these buildings, their slabs, their walls, their columns, their doors, their windows, we have to make sure that those components are reused in new buildings, in new locations, in new configurations, for new purposes, and last but not least, for new generations of users. Thank you very much.